So the sermon today is based on the epistle reading uh, from Paul's letter to the Romans, and it has, uh, we're going to talk about something uh, I think that is very important in it, and that uh, is, is the working of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to use all of, all of the text, uh, but we're going to focus on this part in particular, verse 26, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And that's what we have, the help we need from the helper of God. So grace to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our risen and ascended and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So it was several years ago, but I've actually used this illustration before. But given the text, I thought it was worth sharing again. And there's no shortage of satire or humor on the internet. And a few years back, one fake news slash satirical website posted an article which was written in an attempt to stress how bad the economic climate of our country had become at that time. So let's put it up there, and here's the title. God quietly phasing Holy Spirit out of Trinity. And it says this, and we're going to go uh, over a few slides here. Calling the Holy Trinity overstaffed and over budget. God announced plans Monday to downsize the group by slowly phasing out the Holy Spirit. Given the poor economic climate and the unclear nature of the Holy Spirit's duties, I felt this was a sensible and necessary decision. The Holy Spirit will be given fewer and fewer responsibilities until his formal resignation from the Trinity duties following Easter services this year. Thereafter, the Father and the Son shall be referred to as the Holy Duo. Okay, now before anybody gets too ticked off, this is satire, all right? It's meant to be humorous, not blasphemous, and it was written in an attempt to make a point about the state of the economy at that time. The truth of the matter is, I think the most important point that is made within this fake article is a theological point. And it's one that addresses a huge problem that actually does exist within the Christian church. Because unfortunately, I fear this is how we actually view the work of the Holy Spirit as Christians, as being expendable. Or we're not really sure about what he does and what his role as one of the three persons of the Trinity is. Yeah, we know and like the holy duo, as the article stated. We like God the Father who created all things, and we like God the Son who died on the cross to save us from our sins and connects us back to the Father. But if somebody asked you what the work of the Holy Spirit is, could you answer that question in a way that is biblically accurate? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. That's what I want you to walk out of here knowing a little bit more about what the Bible says about the work and the importance of the Holy Spirit. Because better understanding the work of the Spirit helps us to better understand God, the Trinity, which opens up our faith in great and powerful ways to both believe and live. So let's get down to this. And let's start with who is the Holy Spirit? And let's put up a, a, a graphic here, okay? So you see the sim this is a great place to, to th this is a great room to preach about the Trinity in because it's all over. The symbolism is everywhere. But I like this one. Uh, it's good. It's got the symbol of the Trinity there. Maybe you've seen that on things around here. But uh, <laughs> you have the top, which is God the Father, the Creator, and the lower left is, is God the Son, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then you have the dove over there on the right. Now, this conveys a very important message, and it's this. Who's the Holy Spirit? He's the third person of the Trinity, which means he's only one of three persons in all of existence that can say every morning when they wake up, I am God. Okay, right away that puts him in a special place that we have to honor. Christ tells us when we go out and baptize, which is so crucial, isn't it? He says, you baptize in the name of God. What's the name of God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit was there at the creation, helped to create everything in the world with the Father and the Son. So even though that article that I referred to jokes that the Holy Spirit is expendable, he's only as expendable as God the Father or as Jesus. In other words, not at all. So he's God. He's not the Father, and he's not the Son. 
Okay, he is God, the Holy Spirit. That's a whole other sermon to talk about the Trinity and the three persons in one God. But we're going to get down to the third person. So what does he do? Well, he gives us the ability to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's put this up there. It's a piece of scripture from 1 Corinthians 12. Paul wrote, no one can call Jesus Lord except by the power of the Spirit. See, all kinds of people know about Jesus. They know about God in an academic way. You know, that's not the same as faith, though, where you trust in God. You trust God to provide for you, to give you life, and to save you from your sins. In fact, the Bible makes this point so emphatically. It says, hey, even the demons and the devil know about God. They don't believe in him. So you can't believe in Jesus as your Savior without the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we say we believe in no other gods but the triune God, like we just did in the creed, we're not doing that by our own power. The Spirit has enabled us to believe and confess this. And what saves you for all eternity? Your faith. So he is God, and he enables you to believe in the Son of God who died to pay for your sins and who restores your broken relationship with the Father, which was all tanked after the fall into sin. And now we live in that world that is completely infected by the effects of sin. And that means things get weird, and things get rough, and things get dangerous, and we need help in that world, don't we? We live in a bad world where a lot of bad things happen. Life is tough in this world, isn't it? And our day-to-day existence tells us, look, we can't do this living thing alone. And things do not always go the way that we want them to in this life, do they? Like these pictures prove. Let's put one of them up there. Let's, I don't know if it reads in here. This person's bank card was in the ATM right when the whole system shut down. (laughs) So they lost their card. Or let's go to the next one. A person went into their break room at at, uh, the office to get a donut (laughs) to find this. Yeah, that might be a great example of evil when somebody has gone into the donuts and taken a bite out of all of them. Uh, This next one, you're not having a good day when this happens, are you? Yeah. I really hope they bought the insurance from U-Haul. And you really are having a bad day when this next one happens and an alligator has gotten a hold of your cell phone. Yeah, we live in a broken world. But all cuteness aside, you and I know that life gets way worse than what I just showed you, right? Loved ones die. People get really sick. We have addictions. People we love hurt us. We don't know what we're going to do about our jobs or our finances or the crazy world that we live in. And this is what Paul's telling us. He's saying, don't fret. Don't despair. Have joy. Because we suffer now, yeah. And we live in a world where there is suffering. This is not the end of the story. Our suffering and the troubles of the world is not where this all stops. Something better is coming, he says. In fact, it's this. And we can put it up there on the wall, too, for the people watching from home. This is one of the greatest artistic renderings of an altar that I've ever seen in my life because this is so crucial to what we are building our hope on as Christians. This is the return of Christ depicted here in art. Christ is coming back. In fact, if you want to know how important this day is, okay, not only are we here on earth waiting for it, in heaven they are waiting for it, asking, hey, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? They're excited about it. And this is what Paul is telling us. Look, Christ is coming back to make everything perfect. All that broken stuff that we go through, it's not going to exist anymore one day. And that helps us right now. Knowing Christ is coming back and that he is in control of all things and he's promised that he is coming back to finish the job that he started and do that once and for all, that gives us strength to carry on today while we're in the middle of suffering. He came to make sure that we would know that he will never leave us or forsake us and his cross proved he loves us. And the empty tomb shows us that the payment for our sins that he made, his sacrifice, was sufficient with God the Father. It was accepted by him. 
Now, this is where a lot of people, including ourselves, get hung up on the story. Okay? Many times we Christians wonder, hey, why didn't Jesus just stay on earth instead of ascending into heaven? Because if he was still here, we could ask him questions and we could see his miracles. And life and faith would be so much easier. And Christ responds to this mistaken belief while he was here. He said it in, in the Gospels. He said, why did I not stay here? Because me leaving is going to benefit you. It's for your advantage. He says in the Gospel of John, look, if he doesn't go away, the helper will not come. He says, if I go, I'm going to send him to you. If you really want to be connected to me and what I've done for you, you need the Holy Spirit. He, he tells us that. So Christ is the treasure given to the world by God to pay for our sins and give us everlasting life. But without the Holy Spirit, that treasure never gets put into our personal bank accounts. Okay? It just sits in a museum somewhere for everybody to look at and go, ooh, that's really cool. That's really nice. That's not how this works. The Spirit of God takes all of the work of Christ and makes it personal to you. And he puts that treasure into your personal account for you to use on a regular basis. So because of the Holy Spirit, not only are you saved, but now he has taken the work of Jesus Christ and put it everywhere. So it's effective all over the planet, even in the middle of the United States in a place called Springfield, Illinois. That's what's so important about the ascension. Christ died and rose to conquer sin in the grave for you and me, but had he not ascended and then sent the Spirit, all of his work, all of his gifts stay where Christ is. I don't know how that works. He's the one who designed the system, and he's God. He gets to do that. So while he was here, his gifts weren't distributed like they are now by the power of the Spirit. And so this third person of the Trinity is working for you and me all the time. He really is our helper. He's also there working as our translator to God the Father and saying all of the right things to God on our behalf as we pray. Have you ever been to a foreign country? where you couldn't speak the language, but you tried to speak the language. You gave it a college effort. Karen and I went on a mission trip to Honduras uh, a long time ago, and uh, we worked there with doctors to help people in desperate need of medical attention. So for a couple of days, I was a dental technician. If you are in a dental chair and you look up and see me in a mask and a gown and I'm rooting around in your teeth, you're in big trouble. The sad thing is, is, though, that was better than what they had on a regular basis. So we went to a place in the Honduran mountains. It was called Los Limones. For those of you who know Hablo Espanol, Los Limones is Spanish for the Limones. And I would try and communicate <laughs> until you guys drive me out of Springfield. I'm going to continue to use that joke, all right? It makes me happy to no end. <laughs> But as I was there, I would try and communicate with the patients, and it was, it was so ridiculous. It was so bad. Do you guys know what lo siento means in Spanish? It means I'm sorry. That's one of the few things I learned because I had to say I'm sorry over and over and over again. So they couldn't understand me while I'm trying to communicate with them, and every time the dentist would see me trying to communicate with people, she would just hop in. She spoke Spanish, and she would say the words that I was meaning to say so that they would understand. And after watching this for a few times, I thought, oh, this is like the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. I'm here saying a bunch of gibberish, and the translator would take all of that and make it coherent, make it mean something, make it understood. Well, that's what the Spirit does for us. Not only does he connect us to the Savior of the world and give us the ability to believe and be saved, he also makes sure that we are communicating the right way with the Father. In other words, he is doing massive and eternal things for you and I that we can't do for ourselves. And knowing he's doing this is cause for celebration. It's cause for joy. It's cause for changing everything about our lives. And it gives us power to live in when the suffering is going on. We know that this stuff is not the end of the story. 
But that power and assurance and ability to endure is only found in this God. Even though we are trying desperately to create new things that will fill that God-shaped hole in our lives, we can't do it. What he is promising is stuff that only he can deliver on. So I'm getting ready Tuesday to go back to the Northwest for a couple of weeks. And when I'm there, I will uh, get to see friends I don't get to see a lot. And and I get to talk to them about what I do as a pastor and, and where I do it. And in these conversations, I love to talk about our location here in Springfield at 2nd and Monroe. Do you guys ever stop and think about what goes on here at the corner of 2nd and Monroe, these four buildings that are on the corners? Because on these four corners, there is some important stuff that has gone on in the past and, and still does. So on the southwest corner, you have the Illinois State Capitol. All politics aside, big decisions are made there all the time. Okay, on the northwest corner, you have the Illinois State Armory. Sure, it's seen better days, but some better days are coming for it. They're doing a ton of work on it. But I think about the cool stuff that has gone on in that building over time. It is awesome. Some of the best basketball players to ever play in the state of Illinois have hooped over there. Some of the greatest musicians of all time have played concerts there. Some of the greatest entertainers of all time have entertained there. Sure, one of the worst mass murderers in our history of the United States was a promoter there, but we don't like to talk about that, okay? On the southeast corner, you have the Illinois State Library. In there, do you know this? They have over 5 million items. And it serves as a federal documents depository for the state. Lots of knowledge in that building. Side note here, if you ever walk out of the south part of our sanctuary and look up to the left, have you ever noticed that my name is carved into the rock at the top of the building, along with other great names from the state of Illinois? I mean, they misspelled it, but it was a nice thing to do to welcome Karen and me to Springfield nonetheless. You'll know I'm on my way out of Springfield when you look up one day and you see that it has been corrected (laughs) spelling-wise. Lots of stuff in those three buildings go on that is important. But it's the building on the northeast corner of 2nd and Monroe where the truly important stuff happens. Because this is the house of the ruler of the universe. Nobody gets to elect him to that position. He just is. And no army has ever had the firepower that our God has, and the knowledge of man is nothing compared to the wisdom of God. And all of those supernatural things that he does, they happen in this place. They change time and eternity. I just laid to rest somebody, 96-year-old man who grew up here at Trinity, went to the school when it was back here, And he and his family have moved away, but they have all been influenced by the stuff that has gone on here at Trinity. There are story and story and story and story about people like that, families like that, eternally affected by what has happened here. We are connected in this place to the God of forgiveness and life and love. And that doesn't happen because of us. It happens because of the Holy Spirit. He gives us the treasure of heaven. Let's put this quote from Luther up there. He said this, Christ has purchased and won the treasure for us through his suffering, death, and resurrection, and all that he's done. But if that saving action stays hidden and no one knows about it, then it would all be for nothing, wasted. In order that this treasure might not remain buried but be taken up and enjoyed, God has let the word go forth and be proclaimed. In the word, he has given us his Holy Spirit to lay the treasure of redemption on our hearts and make it our very own. Guys, the treasures of heaven are yours. There's nothing expendable about the Spirit and what he does. He gives us all the help we need to live in the presence of God forever and ever. So that's my prayer for all of us. God would bless us to appreciate to tap into and use the power of the Spirit, 
to live as people of the Spirit, connected to the Father, connected to the Son, and by the power of the Spirit that we would go out into the world and boldly tell people about what this God has done for us and what He wants to do for them. God bless it to be so. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you work the way that you do and that you have the wisdom that you do. Lord, help us to consistently seek to find your heart, to find your will, and to find your design for our lives, which we can do through your word and through the guidance of your spirit. Lord, we thank and praise you that you love us the way you do. And we ask all of these things and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.